Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for attending our third session, Advocacy for Wild Animals. I'm Connie. I'm the Research Associate at Faunalytics, and I'm so excited to present the first speaker of this session, Jin from Bakeningen University and Research, who will discuss China's wild animal advocacy. Take it away, Jin. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so I'll start presenting. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jean. Um, I'm from. I'm a PhD student, student at Wageningen University and a research based in the Netherlands. Uh, today, I'm going to present my research, the roles of non-state actors in China's wild animal advocacy. This research is funded by Center for Effective Altruism. It began in last year, September, and will be completed at the end of this month. For this presentation, I'll first briefly introduce the background of wild animal advocacy in China, then I'll describe the research objective and the methods. Following that, the results, discussion, and recommendations. China has nearly 10% of the world's vertebrates and invertebrate species, which makes it one of the most consequential countries for promoting wild animal welfare. In the last few years, China's wildlife legislation has shifted from one that's focusing on utilization to one that prioritizes protection. China's mainstreaming of ecological civilization is another driver of this paradigm shift, which has been the rationale behind some of the world's largest conservation measures and provided more justification for non-state actors to help wild animals. But language shapes the way we think, and the word welfare in Chinese is associated with benefits beyond the necessity, which has made it quite difficult to promote such a concept in China. Currently, the dominant actors in wild animal advocacy are environmental groups and international animal organizations, and very few of them actually has a specific focus on welfare. Non-state actors in China have flourished in the last decade, Scholars have used concepts such as consultative authoritarianism to characterize a very blurred party-state society relations in China, meaning that non-state actors now have many opportunities to assist the government to provide public services and engage in policy advocacy, but in a very controllable manner. In the absence of an overarching political authority to protect and improve wild animal states of well-being requires cross-sectoral supports, from not only governmental bodies, but also a constellation of non-state actors with diverse skill sets and resources across all regions and at all levels. The goals of this research is to understand what kind of actions are taken by which actors at what levels. Inspired by the good governance literature, I adopted a typology of power sources that can be used by non-state actors to gain authority. There are symbolic power, cognitive power, social power, leverage power, and material power. I also examine their comparative advantages and what governance activities they are perceived to fulfill so that we can identify opportunities for collaboration and the ways to leverage China's green rhetoric for advocacy works. In this presentation, I'll focus mainly on the first part of my analysis and mention some of the uh, key findings of the letter in the discussion section. My research methods have two main components, semi-structured interviews and a survey of non-state actors from different categories. To avoid confusion, welfare is replaced by quality of life in my survey. The non-state actors categories and governance activities are designed based on literature review and preliminary uh, interviews. I won't have time to go into the details, so I'll feature just a few examples in the rest of the presentation. In total, 228 completed surveys and 30 interviews were used. Around 24% of the respondents identify themselves as grassroots volunteers, 18% are domestic NGOs. Though by no means comprehensive, the sample is nonetheless heterogeneous to cover a wide range of non-state actors across different regions. What's worth mentioning is that identities of non-state actors are very fluid, for instance, Many zoos and aquariums are part of China's wild animal rescue system. Scholars and zookeepers have also joined the community of wildlife popularizers online. 
60% of the respondents associate their works as most related to free ranging wild animals that are directly affected by human activities. Around 25% of them indicate their activities are related to free ranging wild animals not directly affected by human activities. The results on their focus area show that wild animal population are the most prioritized. Mental states of individual wild animals are ranked the lowest. The charisma of wild animals weighs more than the physical states of individual wild animals. So an overview of participants' self-assessment of their activities suggests that collect data, publish reports, and make policy recommendations are the most frequently carried out by non-state actors followed by raise public awareness and the build relationships with key decision makers. The least chosen activities are evaluate the effect of policy implementation, followed by represent marginalized groups. To delve a little bit more into each category, the epistemic community and international NGOs have relatively more niched profiles. They are particularly strong with their expertise and access to key decision makers while other actors appear to perform a broader range of activities. Grassroots volunteers and domestic NGOs governance profiles are more action oriented. They are the most active in terms of rescue wild animals, cooperate with relevant departments for monitoring and reporting. Actors who are engaged in frontline actions or observation of individual wild animals actually tend to have the least amount of time uh, and resources to participate in direct policy advocacy. Nevertheless, their data are important empirical evidence essential for environmental NGOs and scholars when they make policy proposals. The measures non-state actors can employ for advocacy work have multiplied over the last decade, but in the meantime, enabling factors could also pose constraints for more innovative measures. For instance, Combating illegal activities remain the dominant priority. Um, activities such as monitoring, reporting, and preventing harmful practices constitute the majority of their workload. Legality can also constrain the space for restrain the space for defending the interests of wild animals that are not nationally protected. For instance, while environmental NGOs can issue public litigations to defend the interests of terrestrial animals they have not been granted the legal standing rights to do so with regards to marine animals. Rescue work is a legal practice, meaning that it is risky for non-state actors to rescue state protected animals, while rescue and shelter units have low incentives to accept non-state protected animals. Discussion. My research shows that non-state actors involved in wild animal advocacy in China perform a very wide range of activities, but few of them have distinctive governance profiles. There is room for non-state actors that have stronger leverage and social power, like environmental NGOs, to find their niche and calculate which animal communities might come more based on welfare. Most of the non-state actors gain their authority through three sources of power cognitive, leverage, and symbolic power, there is need for more material support. In the meantime, I also find that cognitive power could be composed of different dimensions. For instance, epistemic communities' expertise is characterized as unbiased and irrational. Grassroots are associated more with passionate-driven, hands-on experience, while I, in our international NGOs concerns more with capacity building. These different forms of knowledge can be complementary and helpful for facilitating transdisciplinary research and projects. The openness and transparency of local government entities plays a determining role in what kind of activities will be explored. Open letters, public hearings, and mobilizing media have the potential to block destructive projects and attract attention and a collaboration from local government, uh, governmental actors. Whether a policy advocacy campaign is effective depends on the category of non-state actors and its implementation by local governments. The ripple effect of policy learning and experimentation at the city level should not be underestimated. It holds the potential for other jurisdictions and even the central government to adopt policy change on a national level. So finally, recommendations. So aside from organizing more outreach to improve the understanding of wild animal welfare among non-state actors, 
Collaborations that combines different sources of power might be worth exploring, particularly under the promotion of ecological civilization. Pushing private sector to finance and raise industrial standards could be one such an approach. And international NGOs are in a good position to facilitate that. There is also potential for NGOs to help local government and communities to work out ecological compensation and the preventative measures for human wild animal conflicts, pushing for policy and law change in the area of marine environmental allegations. My research shows that issue linkage has been underexplored. We can go beyond common frameworks such as biodiversity conservation or public health by linking, for example, child protection with animal abuse and the power transmission safety with bird protection. Finally, China has a relatively short history of taking conservation measures. Long-term wildlife censuses are lacking. To further improve already existing strategies taken by non-state actors, we can support foundational work such as collecting data for small vertebrates, improving wild animal identification, and increasing the responsiveness and integration of wild animal rescue system down to the county level. Last but not least, because both state and non-state actors in China are still relying on international expertise to further their actions, for international actors, I would recommend to continue to improve current international standards and protocols related to animal welfare and to facilitate English to Chinese translation works in domains such as welfare assessment and the rescue materials. I'll close the presentation with an acknowledgement of all my participants and to Phi and the many individuals who have helped me in the EA networks and I thank uh, Center for Effective Altruism for funding this research. I welcome any suggestions and questions and also please feel free to reach out to me for a chat if you're interested in wild animal advocacy. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that amazing presentation, Jin. Um, it looks like that's all the time we have for this presentation in the interest of time. Um, so if you have any other questions, if you want to uh, keep the discussion going, just please wait until the end of the session where you can go into a breakout room with all the speakers from the session. Um, so next up, we have Paola from the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile, who will present on human bird conflict. Take it away, Paola. Hi. Um, are you see my screen? Uh, yes, it looks good. Fine. Actually. Okay. Mm, human and birds have a long history of interactions. Birds support food, control pests, and have an important symbolism for human and cultures. Indeed, birds can make us feel happy or relaxed. But what happens when these multicolored and melodical birds disgust us? It's the food production of farmers or poop on our house. Well, hi everyone, my name is Paola Araneda and I'm here today to tell you about the human bird conflicts and why some species are so disgusting in some places. We will start by recognizing that people and wildlife have coexisted for millennia. Bears have, all, uh, have also been recognized in the cosmovision of different cultures and play a critical biocultural functions. But also, healthy bird populations are essential to human welfare. As I say, they support farmers, control pests, are ecosystem engineers and provide critical environmental data and so on. But the human wildlife conflicts are the expression of human perception. The conflicts arise from the damage caused by wildlife to the source used by people. At the, at the same time, people perceive local fauna as a threat to their well-being. So in many times, human and, and, and wildlife depend on the same resource in the ecological niche. However, human wildlife conflicts refer mainly to damage caused by animals to resource used by people but we understood that wildlife are not in a conscious position against humans. 
Drivers of human wildlife conflicts include human population growth, land use change, and human proximity to natural or protected areas, among others. These factors can increase the probability for direct competitions over critical resources, such as space and food. Furthermore, Ecological traits or characteristics of species like history determine the strategy for resource acquisitions and simultaneously a species likelihood to cause damage. But what we know about human wildlife conflict? Studies usually focus on charismatic megafauna because they represent an important trait to human safety and production activities in many cities. However, in terms of the extent of damage, smaller animals such as bears have, it may have larger effects on local livelihoods. Human bird conflicts may have significant impacts on a broad range of human interests in terrestrial and aquatic socio-ecosystems, such as crop damage, attacks on livelihoods, damage to commercial fisheries, spread of diseases and parasites, collisions with vehicles and other infrastructure posing a risk to human safety, and nuisance in urban areas. Human birth conflicts appear distributed worldwide and might differ according to the human interests involved impact the wildlife species and the socioeconomic conditions in countries where conflicts occur. For instance, countries with a relatively low multidimensional human development index may have more conflicts compared with developed countries. On the other hand, species ecological traits may determine the number of resources exploded by a bird species and thus may be associated with the extent of the conflict. Although the human bird conflicts or HBC have been examined in some locations, studies have mostly been conducted using a species specific and case by case approach. And there has been no systematic review of HBC for different taxa, geographic areas, and socioeconomic uh, indicators. So, to know which socioeconomic attributes and ecological traits are related to the conflicts, we define two response variables. The degree of knowledge as the number of publication examining conflicts, but sorry, uh, yes, and the conflict extent, <laughs> I mean, um, as the number of human interests affected uh, by wildlife. To do this, we conducted an internet basal search for peer review journals and um, uh, uh, academic books examining human bird conflicts. Therefore, 166 publications were included in the review to improve and to improve this, uh, the review quality we follow with the uh, PRISMA protocol. So, we both profile uh, of the socioeconomic indicators of countries where conflicts occur such as uh, the Human Development Index from the United Nations and the ecological trait of species involved in worldwide conflicts such as dietary breadth, clutch size, aggregation behavior, habitat types, migration patterns, feeding type, distribution range, and population trends. Then, what have we found? In the map, countries with the most species involved in conflicts with dark red color were positively correlated with the number of HBC publication countries with bigger blue circles. For example, United States had the most number of HBC publications, followed by India and Australia in the blue circles. And the countries with the most species involved in HBC were uh, the United States and Australia with their darkest red colors. We recorded 161 species uh, in 49 families involved in this conflict. The most represented uh, groups were dogs, crows, raptors, and girls and parrots with the same uh, proportion. The degree of knowledge of conflict was positively associated with, con with countries classified as low human development 
HBC had the greatest impacts in less developed countries where agriculture is fundamental to rural livelihoods. Paradoxically, the, the, the countries with the relatively higher species richness where conservation efforts have been implemented are those where conflicts are likely to cure and produce great ecological and socioeconomic impacts. But this pattern is consistent with previous research that has reported that uh, less developed countries often host relatively higher richness of wildlife species, have um, a network or predicted area has grown exponentially relative to developed uh, countries, have more local farmers and subsistence communities that depend on agriculture and have a rapid and intensive land cover and land use change and have a lower socioeconomic status and less political with, to deal with damage. But what about birds? The conflict extent was positively associated with species with a broad dietary breadth, for example, up to three dietary categories consumed. Generally, species are better adapted to anthropized environment than specialists because of a competitive advantage. In the, um, over 91% of reported conflict bureau species were involved in conflicts over human food resource chiefly due to crop and livestock damage. Species with broad diets have been reported as conflict bears in several studies involving, for example, urban areas. In turn, we found that HBC are increasing worldwide and part of these conflicts are heterogeneous. The degree of knowledge have greatest impacts on less developed countries with agriculture is critical for rural livelihoods. The conflict stand uh, generally species are better adapted to tropical environments than specialists due to competitive advantage. And as a consideration, so we think that ecological, sociocultural and political uh, perspective should be included to better protect both biodiversity and local livelihoods. And if you want to know more about uh, the implication of this work, you can search the published papers uh, in the web or in uh, ResearchGate. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, uh, Paola, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I think we have time for one question. Uh, so we have a question from Karen. She says, I'm unclear on the definition of the vertical axis that talked about DOK species in less developed countries. Am I understanding correctly that more developed countries had a higher diversity of species mentioned in conflicts in the publications and less developed had a lower diversity of species involved? even while having more HPC conflict overall? Yes, um, can I respond in Spanish and can you uh, translate me, please? Alrighty, yes. Thanks. Um, la diferencia es que eh, en los países menos desarrollados, um, las especies, eh, o sea, hay un mayor número de publicaciones sobre la misma especie. En cambio, en los países más desarrollados hay más publicaciones, efectivamente, pero sobre diferentes especies. Okay, so in the difference is that in less developed countries, uh, there are less publications, um, while in more developed countries there is a greater number of publications, but on different species. Yes? Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Um, all right, so in the interest of time, uh, we will move on to the next presentation. Thank you again, Paola. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Ana Abrao, who will present on wild animal cultivated meat. So take it away, Ana. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. And let's see where I have my presentation. 
seeing presenter mode right now. Mm, it's because I have a double. I don't know how to do it. Um, can I do it that way? Uh, sure. Let's try it out. I don't know how to undo. How can is that um, is there anywhere? You might be able to uh, right click and be able to exit, I think. <laughs> no, I'm gonna yeah, do it. You can go anyway, ahead. Just, yeah, okay. I'm sorry for that. Okay. So, yes, I'm Anna Abraham. I'm speaking from Brazil. I'm a researcher at the Federal University of Paraná. And this project, this research it was, uh, we had no funding, so we made it independently. And it's called Cultivated Biodiversity, uh, Cultivated Wheat as an Alternative to Help Amazon Conservation. For sure, we don't have this pretension to save the Amazon, but it's you know, a help to do it. So not only the rainforest is in danger, but also many species, they are hunted in an illegal way in the area. So manatee is the main animal, is a very big mammal that lives in the Amazon River. Those turtle also, they are hunted for subsistence. This really, really big fish also uh, is in danger and this is a small mammal called cuchilla. I couldn't find a way like to translate it in English, I'm sorry. But yeah, so this illegal hunting is illegal since, since 1967, but it still happens due to the lack of fiscalization because Amazon is a huge forest, as, as you all know, it's almost 7 million uh, square kilometers. And the consumption of those wild animals is important economic resource for people who live there like they have like local and traditional culture of, of, of this uh, kind of consumption. So it's for their, their subsistence, mostly for indigenous, but it's happening also for profits. So people do kill those animals. And so there is no fiscalization. So we have irregular abattoirs. So it creates an illegal and unsafe bush meat market. So the scenario is a chaos and it makes a lot of pressure over natural resource, hamper inspection by regulatory bodies and foster a parallel irregular and insecure market. So why are people buying it? Because it's future, because uh, people are curious about tourists and people from the city, big city, Manaus is a big city and they, they sell those uh, illegal meat. And how to solve this problem? Education, fiscalization, technology, and innovation. And also creativity. So I'm sorry for this awful picture, but this is what happens. And this is the negative impact of uh, this illegal hunting in Amazon. So there is reduction and extinction on the population density, destruction, and fragmentation of natural habitats, increase in the currency of zoonoses, um, ecological imbalance because of those big mammals, as I said, the manatee, we have a whole ecosystem around it. So once this is, this num the number of these species decrease, so you generate this ecological imbalance and degradation of this ecosystem as a whole Negative modification of eating habits from other species and also from the communities, because people who are not supposed to eat it, like tourists or people from the city, 
It decreased the, the food for those indigenous and those people who used to eat this as a cultural thing. So, and also we have difficulty in maintaining the cultural eating behaviors and practice of those local communities. So this is a, what a poaching and a bush meat market look like in the capital of Amazon. And our objective, uh, the, main, the main aim of a, our research is how cultivated meat can help to decrease this impact. So we would collect a cell from a wild animal, which is no cause no harm to the to the animal and they don't die. So we collect the cell and we multiply this uh, in bioreactors. So we have like this cell expansion and a differentiation between the, the tissues, the fat cells and the muscle cells. And after we reproduce them in those bioreactors, we can put them together in a can. So it would be like a confit. Uh, confit de la Montan to sell to France, a cultivated manatee in oil in US and broadly. So the cultivated process of it is basically the same for the cultivated meat as uh, regular traditional meat. So we interview 11, 11 experts and, and we show them this business proposal model which would reverse the money to uh, Amazon. So our proposal is about uh, collecting the cell donor, making this in a can. So in this can, it will have um, a QR code. So this QR code, you could see the fish swimming, you could see the turtle alive, and you could see the manatee alive swimming in the river. Uh, which would be an effective appeal of this product. And the whole royalties of this uh, product would be reversed to NGOs uh, to uh, that work with uh, manatee preservation, Amazon conservation, and other institutes of research as well. So this is uh, our methodology was a qualitative research with a semi-structured questionnaire, choosing 11 experts of cultivated meat people from um, all sectors, private sectors, public sectors, policy makers, uh, biologists, engineers, uh, also uh, venture capital startups uh, from all over the world, people from Israel, Singapore, Holland, uh, USA, and Brazil. And we conducted those interviews between May 2021 and April 2022. Then it, uh, we have uh, the, the transcription of the interviews and analyze them throughout a SWOT uh, matrix, which is um, analyzing the strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats of this uh, proposal model, and then discussing the main findings, which is uh, our results. I don't know if you guys can, can read it. So, for example, our strength is uh, what people say, what the interviewees uh, answered in our questionnaire was, most people will have a curiosity about the origin originality of this product, would have also an altruistic perception by some consumers, which brings beneficial feeling like I'm buying this product to help in order to help Amazon. Uh, and also would be a unique experience for them. As I said before, it will also have an effective appeal of the manatee. So you are eating their meat while they are swimming throughout the river which an exotic meat is a delicatessen. Also, um, in, in Amazon, we have this uh, special dish, it's a delicatessen called Michia, which is consumed for a long time. Uh, they put the, the muscle, the, the meat, inside the fat of the animal. So it's, it's already a delicatessen. Um, people would be also contributing to preservation. It will also improve research development since the money would be uh, reversed to this, to those institutions. 
more opportunity, we can reach international market, we can open new patents, uh, we can work with a great variety of meats because not only manatee, and it could boost the economy by offering new jobs due to the cultivated meat chain is, is very specialized. Like we need many people working on it. So we have this economic benefit as well. And we, we can replace the consumption of endangered animals by the local community. One of our interviewees gave us this suggest suggestion by instead of uh, instead of taking the money, instead of uh, re reinvesting the royalties, people who buy a can could donate another can for a community. So they will make sure that this, this product would be available for those uh, communities. They also said that it's a seductive idea. The production logistics royalties related to the social development as well. But in another hand, we also have weakness and threats, which uh, I think that the most important is the rebound, the unwanted rebound effect of it, because many people would buy the cultivated meat and would be curious to buy the real deal. So, so instead of uh, minimizing, reducing the hunting, it could improve. And both biologists interviewees, they were from this institution that protect humanities. This was the main concern of, the, of theirs. And they say that instead of manatee, of uh, cultivated meat of manatee, we should promote uh, cultivated meat of beef cattle, even because beef cattle is the main causes of the deforestation of the Amazon. So we thought this would be a, a good idea as well. And another weakness of this model that many uh, interviewees said is was like many consumers doesn't have that much information. So neophobia would be a problem. Neophobia, people don't have information. They don't have, like, they, they, they are not used to eat uh, wild animals. So I don't, they don't think they would buy this idea. Uh, so there is this uncertainty regarding the conception. Uh, the Amazon area is too large. So as I said, it's almost 7 million square kilometers. So to reverse this money, you know, to fiscalization, to track, to patrol is too hard. So those are the weakness and threats of uh, this uh, proposal model that we have it, this idea. So this is what I have to, to show and to share with you guys. This is our research group. Uh, we thank you very much for, it, for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be very glad to answer. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. That was a great presentation. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions at the moment, but once again, if you want to continue this discussion, ask any questions, just please wait until the end of the session when you can go into a breakout room um, and be with all the speakers from the session. So our last speaker in this session is Carl, Phonolytics' own content director, who will be presenting on citizen science for conservation. So take it away, Carl. Great, thank you. And uh, I'm not joining from space <laughs> as much as it looks like I am. And Phonolytics is a remote workplace and I'm sure I could sort out the hours. Um, I'm actually joining you from Peterborough, Ontario, which is the uh, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Mississaugig First Nations. Um, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. If you can make that full screen, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, just so that. better. There we go. Okay, so uh, my talk today is called Taking a Walk on the Wild Side on the Importance of Citizen Science and How You Might Employ It in Your Research. Um, basically, I'm going to make the case for citizen science and why I think it's a good thing and why more people should try to use it. Um, if you're already familiar with citizen science, uh, this will be probably all stuff that you know already. Uh, but I've gathered together 
lots of cute animal photos throughout that you can pay attention to instead of me. So for some caveats, uh, first of all, I'm not a scientist. Second of all, I'm not a researcher. Uh, before you click away and log off, uh, I do read a lot of scientific research. Um, so a bit about me, I'm Phonolytics Content Director. I have an MA in Communications and Cultural Studies, uh, studying Canadian rodeo culture. I was a filmmaker and undercover investigator for animal groups in the early 2010s. And since I started with Phonolytics in 2014, um, I estimate that I've read and summarized about a thousand scientific articles, uh, which you can find in our research library. Um, so what is citizen science for, for those of you who don't know? Well, uh, let's say you and your friends uh, go down to the local beach every day and you take uh, pH readings and you keep a little Google Doc spreadsheet of the pH readings from the beach every day and you monitor those things. Um, yourselves. Well, uh, that might be science, and you might be doing something scientific, but it's not really citizen science in the true sense of the term. Uh, in the simplest terms, it's the collection and analysis of data by members of the general public, uh, but it's often done on behalf of and in collaboration with scientific professionals. So generally speaking, it's not citizen-led. The supervision of a scientific professional is kind of part of the whole thing. Um, why do we need it? Uh, well, if you're a researcher or a scientist, you probably already know this, but uh, first and foremost, we need it because research is expensive. Hiring personnel uh, may be out of your budget, um, and in fact, it probably is outside of your budget to hire as many people as you need to to do your project. Secondly, time. Research is time consuming, and more hands make for lighter work. And third, connecting to the above two points, is coverage. Scientists can't be everywhere or even most places all at once. And depending on the scale of the project, uh, this can be an even more important aspect. So for example, you know, it might be one thing to, uh, you know, study the biodiversity of a forest in your town. Um, it's an entire it's an entirely other thing uh, to try and understand, uh, let's say, the population abundance of a certain species in your state or even across your whole country. At some point, if you want to do science at a certain scale, you need to bring in other people. So I wanted to share some examples with you um, to just give you an idea of the different forms that citizen science can take. So first is eBird. This is probably one of the, the better known ones in the world. Um, it's run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, the project receives about 100 million bird sightings uh, that are contributed each year. Birders are given a checklist and they record data collected within a simple scientific framework. And there's a free mobile app that allows offline data collection anywhere in the world. And you can explore the data that you've collected and that other people have collected uh, right on the on the uh, eBird website. It's really great. I, I encourage you to check it out. Another project that I think is really fascinating and offers a different form of citizen science is the camera catalog. And I have to say so many citizen science projects have fun puns in the name. <laughs> it was one of my favorite parts of researching uh, this presentation. So uh, camera catalog is run by the conservation organization Panthera which is dedicated to um, protecting wild cats and their ecosystems. The vast majority of the work uh, in this project is actually done by scientists with camera traps and computers. So scientists go around to different habitats and ecosystems and set up cameras all over the place. Uh, the problem is that when you set up a whole bunch of cameras that are triggered by motion, you get thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of photos. Uh, so that's where the citizen scientists come in. Uh, people. Uh, volunteers comb through the camera trap photos and with the help and guidance uh, from some documents from the catalog program, uh, they help to manually identify and classify all of the image and help to train the computer to do so as well. So my third example is one called Eyes of the Reef. It's run by an organization called Reef Check Hawaii. And uh, yes, corals are animals. Uh, Citizen scientists who, uh, you know, are, are snorkeling or scuba diving make reports about coral bleaching and disease, 
and they're trained using resources that are provided by the EOTR group. Their info provides the critical first tier of Hawaii's rapid response contingency plan. So this is a plan that's put in place by the government uh, to react as quickly as possible to events that include, you know, coral disease, coral bleaching, and crown of storm, crown of thorn starfish outbreaks. Um, and citizen scientists are actually the first people who alert the government about this. So there are all kinds of different ways to do citizen science. And it's also important to have a framework to, um, to do it within. So recently here in Canada, the government of the province of Alberta released what it calls the citizen science principles of good practice. Um, the goal is to give these projects more legitimacy so they can be uh, more broadly used. They came up with six, and I think they're great. One, citizen science programs should include a clear purpose and scientific outcome. You're not just collecting data for the sake of collecting data. You need to have a project. Uh, two, citizen science data and the protocols used to collect them uh, should be appropriate to the project. That should go for every scientific project. Uh, citizen science programs should be open and transparent. Uh, so in other words, you're not collecting data and then keeping it behind a paywall or keeping it behind closed doors. Um, this is sort of akin to like an open source approach. Um, you're making everything open and public. Programs should be inclusive and participants should have opportunities to participate actively, productively, and meaningfully. So, you know, a lot of the ways this that people might participate in these programs might kind of seem like what people would describe as grunt work or, or things that uh, other people don't want to do. Um, but they are ways that people, they should be ways that people are contributing meaningfully to an actual project. Five citizen science programs should benefit all participants. So the people collecting the data should ideally learn something uh, in the process, they're not just collecting, you know, they're not just looking at a spreadsheet of numbers. And finally, the programs must account for safety, ethical, and legal standards. So how can you use citizen science? You're watching this presentation, you're wondering, okay, well, that's great, but how does this apply to me? Well, you can use citizen scientists to help you design experiments. So if you have started an experiment, you can consult with people on the ground that can help you know which questions to ask. You can even do this, and I would say it's probably in your best interest to do this before you even start a project. Uh, you can use citizen scientists to gather data, as I've mentioned, in the wild or in non-wild spaces. You, you can have them analyzing data, uh, like in the camera catalog, uh, coding and sorting, and you can get them to solve, help you solve problems. They can provide on the ground knowledge that can let scientists know why a particular study or experiment isn't working the way that you think it's going to. Super important. And why does any of this matter? Well, citizen science is already being used all over the world. In a global review of 400 citizen science projects, uh, they found that about 1.3 million volunteers participate annually around the world. They actually uh, estimated that this could be as high as uh, 2 million people around the world participate annually. And that participation is valued at about 2.5 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars uh, annually. Um, as animal advocates, we are just you know, beholden to tight budgets and uh, restricted resources involving people in your uh, animal advocacy projects and in your animal advocacy research can be a huge help. And that is my hope uh, that you will take from this talk. So thank you so much. This is a self-portrait that I took this morning. And as our resident librarian, it behooves me to ask you to subscribe to our weekly email alerts if you haven't already. Uh, we had an, uh, we have had an amazing turnout today. Uh, if you all sign up for our newsletter, if you haven't already, that would be awesome. Phonalytics.org slash sign up. And that's it for me. Thank you for the excellent presentation, Carl.